الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على من بعث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ما شاء الله الحمد لله May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really reward all of you brothers and sisters who have come here to listen to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an. And as you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that in the house in which the Qur'an is recited and in which the Qur'an is studied, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sakina, the peace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the tranquility of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, descends upon that house and the angels come down and they cover the whole gathering they go around covering the whole gathering with their wings so the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present here in the masjid anyway but especially the fact that you've come to study the Quran learn from the Quran hear the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah there'll be extra barakah and sakina and and rahmah inshallah just a few introductory, introductory remarks before we go on to the actual tafsir. The Qur'an, alhamdulillah, is an amazing blessing that we have. It's an incredible gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It contains all of the guidance that every one of us need. It contains anything, any situation that you're in, any problem you're facing, any challenges you're facing, as an individual, as families, as communities, as an ummah, all of the solutions are in the Qur'an. Every single situation that you could face in this world, the solutions are there in the Qur'an. This is an incredible blessing. This is the only ummah that has the authentic, preserved words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No other nation can claim this. And no other nation actually claims to have possession of the preserved words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is only this nation, the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that subhanallah covers or is, fills up whatever is between the heavens and the earth. He said subhanallah, just two words, fills up whatever is in the heavens, between the heavens and the earth. When we face a problem when we find ourselves without money may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enrich all of us when we find ourselves being fired from a job or facing some kind of material loss maybe you've lost a loved one a child or a parent or maybe some calamity you're facing in your life something to do with material possession what is the first reaction what is the first reaction? As a community now, we're facing huge challenges in America, in Europe. What is the first reaction? Our natural reaction is we wish we could, we wish we could replace that thing that we've lost. Our natural first instinct goes to the apparent, goes to the material, goes to that which we can see, touch and feel. It goes to the thing that we have lost. So if we're discriminated, if we're powerless, if we're powerless as a community, if we're weak as a community, we want political power. We wish we had strength and power as an ummah. We wish we had strength and power as a community. We wish we had strength and influence as a community. But look at this, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi saying, Subhanallah, just two words is, is better than everything that is on the earth and, and it fills up what is between the heavens and the earth. So how can we feel a sense of loss? How can we feel, how can you feel that you have lost something? Or that you are weak? Or that you are discriminated against? Or that you don't have power? Or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't given you political dom domination on the earth? How can we feel that when we have the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The, the Persian poet, Kahani, 6th century Persian poet, he said in, in Farsi, I don't read Farsi, but it translated into Arabic, Lahzatun ma'allah afdalu min mulki Sulaiman. A, a moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better than the kingdom of Sulaiman alayhi salam. 
a moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better than the kingdom of Sulaiman alayhi salam. Meaning, most of our problems, most of our challenges, most of the things we think about is to do with material wealth, material power, material possession, our status in this world. But he's saying, you know, just a moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where you connect where you feel the sincerity, where your tears are coming out from dua and sincere cries and pleas to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is better than the kingdom of Sulaiman alayhi salam. Abu Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi, he was left after Salat al-Isha in the masjid reciting a verse. They came back just before Fajr and they found him in Salah reciting the same verse. They found him in Salah, reciting the same verse. The verse was, وَمْتَازُ الْيَوْمَ أَيُّهَا الْمُجْرِمُونَ So Imam Abu Hanifa was reciting this verse. It means basically, O oh, you criminals, today separate yourselves. Meaning on the day of judgment, Allah will say to the criminals, those who disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, they're called mujrim, criminals. Stand separated from the rest of people. Distinguish yourself. Identify yourself. Just on that, Abu Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi, he was just so in awe and fear of this verse, of the meaning of this verse. In case, you know, am I one of those criminals who will be asked on the day of judgment to stand aside? from the rest of humanity. Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi he is reciting this verse all night in the Salah. Just keeps on re repeating until just before Fajr. Ibn Taymiyyah, when people were plotting against, against Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi and word went to the governor, to the Amir, that Ibn Taymiyyah is plotting to take over your kingdom. He's got soldiers, he's got people behind him, he's got power, influence, he's popular as a sheikh. He's coming to take over your kingdom. The Amir sends people to Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah alayhi, to ask him, is this true? What, what are you planning? Why are you doing this? If it's true, then obviously we'll kill you right here and there. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah said, why would I be doing that? Your kingdom, to me, is not worth even the value of a fly of a mosquito. Why would I be doing this? So these are the people who understood what the Quran, the perspective that the Quran gives us as believers. It puts the right value on everything. The Quran allows us to see, as the Prophet said, Oh Allah, allow us to see haq as it is, as it truly is and allow us to see batil as it truly is, falsehood as it truly is, and allow us to uh, stay away or uh, avoid the batil and follow the haqq. So this is the Qur'an. This is the Qur'an that will give us this perspective. It's the Furqan that will distinguish between what is right, what is wrong, what is valuable and what is useless, what is valueless. What is the purpose of the Qur'an before we go on to Surah Al-Fatiha? The purpose of the Qur'an can be understood when we understand our own purpose. What is the purpose of us being here? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us? What is our role here? What, is, what are we meant to be doing? If we understand this, we can understand the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us two uh, clear indications about two purposes in the Qur'an. One is ibtila, and that is to be tried and tested. The second is ubudiyah, to be servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we understand these two as our purposes, we will understand the purpose of the Qur'an. What is the goal of the Qur'an? What is the Qur'an meant to do? In terms of ibtila, this is obviously very clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will try us, He will give us tribulations. Um, we will be tried in many things, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
in the Quran, ولا نبل أنكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات. Five things, five things we will be tested in: hunger, fear, some loss of uh, wealth, some loss of life, and the fruits of whatever we grow or agriculture, business, whatever. We will face some of these tests. It's, it's a guarantee. This is the Darul Ibtila. Addunya Daru, Addunya Daru, Man La Dara La, Wa Yajma'u Fiha Man La Aqla La. The dunya is the home, the abode of the homeless, the one who has no true home. Meaning the believers, their true home is Jannah. But those who don't have a true home, a permanent home in Jannah, they're the ones who, for this dunya, is their home. And they're the ones who amass wealth, gather wealth in this dunya. They're the ones who have no intellect. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that He will be testing us with these five things. A loss of life, wealth, our produce, our investment in business, and we'll face some fear. We'll face hunger. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us. What will the Quran do? The Quran will tell us in every single situation of these five tests what should be our reaction. How should we respond? What should we be thinking? How should we, how should we understand this test? This is what the Quran will be telling us. The Quran will be telling us the rules of life, the sunans of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran, for example, Nuh alayhi salam, he gave da'wah for how long? 950 years. Did they respond to him positively? Did he have a huge following? He was mocked. They rejected him. They mocked him. They said, he's building a, a, a ship, a boat on dry land. They, 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 they took him for a laugh. None of them followed him except for a few. Was this a trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Was this a tribulation? But look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Nuh alayhi salam. He says that, إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَبْدًا shakura. So the way Nuh alayhi salam saw this tribulation, this trial, he saw it as a gift. He saw it as a blessing. Because you can't be abdan shakura. Shukur means... You say, you give gratitude, you show gratitude. You say thank you for a favor that's been done to you. Hamd is when you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless of whether he does any favor to you or not. But shukr is only in response to a favor done to you. Nuh alayhi salam is described as abdan shakura, even though for 950 years his da'wah was rejected. This was a trial and tribulation for Nuh alayhi salam. But he saw that, as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that trial, in that tribulation, he saw that as a gift, and therefore he was showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Social media now is in absolute meltdown. Because of political situation, because of certain trends we're seeing across the pond in Europe, people are in fear. People are really worried about the future, Muslims particularly. But how are we viewing this? How are we understanding this challenge? And what are we exactly supposed to do? Many people are taking different routes, but the Quran will tell you exactly what to do. And it's not the first thing that comes to your mind. It's not whatever emotion comes to you. The Quran will tell you exactly what to do. But you've got to bear with it. You've got to stick with it. You've got to have full yaqeen in it. The physical laws that we have, how many people have any doubt about it, about gravity? You drop something, it's going to fall. Or the fact that you can't walk through that wall, it's impossible. I mean, you believe that 100%, the physical laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created social and moral laws, his sunan, which are even more solid than, than the physical laws. 
they are more solid than the physical laws. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ You better believe it. The end is for the believers. That is a law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is a sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is more solid. It is more permanent than the physical laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what the Quran will give us. Civilization has advanced through discovering the physical laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've sent people to the moon. We've sent robots to Mars. But you can be the most advanced technological civilization, but yet on the human and moral level, you could be the most barbaric at the same time. And vice versa, you could be the highest moral example of a human being if you follow this Quran, and you, you may have nothing of the worldly advanced technology and, and all these discoveries and power and etc. But you will be the highest role model, the highest example of, of civility, of ethics, of morality, of goodness in this dunya. This is what the Quran would give you. The other thing is ubudiya. The two main purposes of the human being, ibtila, to be tried and tested, for guaranteed. Guaranteed you will be tested. The prophets are the most tested of people because they are the most beloved of people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only tests those whom he loves. The second is ubudiya. The second purpose of you and I, of being on this earth, is to be the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To be in his slavehood. To be submitting, surrendering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, the Quran will tell us how to do this. Not just ritual worship, not just salah or, or zakat or hajj. But in every aspect of our lives, how can we bring all of our actions, all of our thinking, all of our um, ways that we live our lives and interact with other people, how can we bring all of this within the remit and fold of Islam that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can we be abd, true servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ibadur Rahman, how can we be true servants of Ar Rahman? This is the second thing that the Quran will tell us in clear detail. The problem with us is that we have been distant away, far away from the Quran. One of the reasons, obviously, is the language. We read the Quran every day in Salah or outside Salah, but we don't access the meanings. How many of us really pick up a translation and read through the meanings? And even the, the lot of the um, eloquence and beauty and meaning and wisdom is lost in the translation. A lot of it's lost. We'll see with just Bismillah rahman rahim Just this first one ayah, we'll see how the meaning is lost in translation. So as Muslims, as individuals, as communities, we must return back to the Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where, where guidance for every situation is there. Powerful motivation, reminders, the dunya is like that, like a jewelry shop, but something wrong inside. There's, there's diamonds, precious stones, rubies, emeralds, platinum, gold, silver, everything. But the pricing is wrong. <laughs> the cheapest metal, the tin and the copper and, and, and just stone, is the most expensive in that shop. And the most precious stones, diamonds, and precious metals, gold, platinum, these are the cheapest priced in that shop. So people rush towards the useless, worthless goods in the shop thinking this is of value, thinking this is what is to be desired. This is, this is the similitude of the dunya. It's like being in that shop, but the believers through the Quran can see what is worth the most can see the true value of everything. They will know gold for, for, for what it is. They will know platinum and diamonds for what it is. The Quran will give them that perception, that basira, that inner sight to see beyond the superficial, beyond the apparent, beyond the material, 
This is what the Quran will do for us, inshallah. So, there's many, many things we could say about the Quran, but obviously, we don't want to spend the whole first session without starting on, on any of the verses of the Quran. One other thing, last thing to say is come to the Quran completely empty. You know, they say, you know, keep, leave your bags outside or leave your baggage outside. When you come to the Quran, truly try and leave your baggage outside. Baggage could be cultural baggage. Baggage could be sectarian baggage. So many people are introduced to the Quran through groups. You belong to this group, you learn their ideology, and then you learn the Quran through that ideology. Right? So if you believe in a, if you're with a group that only focuses on, I don't know, tazkiyah, spiritualism, or purification, and, and overemphasizes that at, at the expense of other things, then you'll see the Quran through, through that lens. Or another group only talks about politics. Only, there'll be time for questions, inshallah, after, after the session. Another group only sees the political. You know, if only we have political power, everything will be set right. And they read the Quran, they'll, they'll see it through those lenses. Not everybody, but I'm saying in general, this is how many Muslims, especially young, active Muslims, are introduced to the Quran. Or it could be some other ideology. I see on Facebook, sometimes people talking about you don't need the hadith anymore, you don't need the sunnah anymore, Qur'aniyun, just the Qur'an. And they view the Qur'an just like that. They don't, they, don't, uh, they don't believe in the hadith. But we have to come to the Qur'an empty, empty. Don't, don't bring any baggage. Forget whatever you've learned if it's not from the Qur'an. Come, don't come to give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can, how can we give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We come to take from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We come to take from the Qur'an. We don't come to give to the Qur'an. We can give the Qur'an nothing. Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, he said, you know, which, which uh, heaven or which sky will protect me and which earth will, will, will provide me with refuge if I say something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he did not intend. So we, we come to the Qur'an empty, without any baggage, without any prejudices, without any preconceptions. We must leave all that behind and be prepared to listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Yes, obviously, every person who explains the Qur'an through, uh, through our tradition, the, the mufassireen, the people who explained the Qur'an and delved into that, yes, they'll have certain opinions which they add to the tafsir, and tafsir is full of that. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something clearly, and it's very easily understood, it's very black and white if you like, we must be prepared to take that on. We must be prepared to internalize that. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, has, has a view on something, we as believers must believe in that fully. So let, let us begin with, Bismillahir uh, Rahmanir Rahim. I'll talk about the virtues of Surah Fatiha probably next week. I'll, I'll begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim because there's some difference of opinion. Not everybody uh, reckons Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim to be part of Surah Al-Fatiha. Mainly Imam al-Shafi'i he, and, and other scholars and other tabi'in and some, some sahaba said that Surah Fatiha includes Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. But the others, other scholars, uh, Imam Malik, Abu Hanifa, rahmatullah alayhi, one of the opinions of Imam Ahmad and, and their students, they said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is a separate ayah in the Quran. It's not part of Surah Fatiha. It's not in the Surah. So that's why you get in the Salah differences in recitation. Some Imams, when they recite loud, they'll recite the Bismillah and then Surah Fatiha because they believe it to be part of Surah Fatiha or uh, something similar to that. So let's start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim um, and then we'll go on to Surah Al-Fatiha. So most of us know the translation of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name 
of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Usually that's how it's translated. Now, the, the, the ba here is for the letter ba, bismillah. There's two words here, ba and ism. Ba and ism, bism, millah. Three words. Let's focus on those three first. In the name of Allah. The ba, they said, is for three things. It could be that you're saying, I begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or I begin by the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or I begin with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whichever way you look at it, you're beginning with reliance or seeking help, isti'ana. Relying and seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the word ism here, bismillah, what does that mean? Name of Allah. Ism is name, but it has three related meanings. Ism, first of all, uh, because in Arabic, the same word, A could have many meanings. Like Ain. Ain means, it could mean I. It could mean the, found, uh, the, the source of, of a spring, fountain. It could mean a spy, etc. It could have multiple meanings. But the same letters can also be rearranged slightly to come with different meanings too. So ism, there are three, three main meanings connected with ism. The first one is a samu. Samu is anything that is elevated, anything that is high. Like sama, sama is sky, heavens. It is high up. Anything above you is Sama, that's what they say. So sumu, it, has, it gives the meaning of elevation, something that is raised. Then you have two other meanings, wasmun, which is a distinguishing mark. When you brand the animal to, to mark it as yours, or when you brand anything, or you put a mark on something to, to show who it belongs to, or, or to distinguish it from other things, this is called wasmun. It's, it's a distinguishing brand or a sign or a mark. Then another meaning is simply beauty. Wasim or wasama. It means that thing which is beautiful. Right? That thing which is beautiful. So you have three things here. You begin whatever we do with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or with this expression which combines three things. One is elevation, it's high. Then all of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are elevated. And whoever uses these names, they too are elevated, their actions are elevated through these names. The second thing is, when we begin in his name, we mark and identify, we distinguish this action, we put a stamp on it, that this is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you do an action and you say Bismillah, you are actually marking this action, branding it with the name of Allah, meaning you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, it's related to tawakkul and tawheed, to do something sincerely and purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third thing that we do is when we start something with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as from the third meaning of ism, is that we beautify the action. We beautify the action because we're starting off with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah jamilun, inna Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal. That indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and he loves beauty. So whenever we do, we begin an action, automatically we are getting the benefit of these three things. Automatically, just from the word ism. And then we come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ismullah. Bismillah. We begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 99 names and more. But all of these names are gathered, represented into one name, which is Allah. That is his, if you like, proper name, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of the others are names and attributes. Some of them are both. Names and attributes. But, you know, for example, Ar-Razaq, the one who provides, this is an attribute, or it's also a name. But you can't say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's all he does. He's not just Ar-Razaq. Or 
al ghafur right? He is the one who forgives often. But you can't say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all he is, his only action is forgiveness. No, he does so many other things. He has so many other names and attributes. But all of these are gathered in the name Allah. And they said that Allah, the word Allah, this comes from four related meanings. Four related meanings. The first one, Al-Ilah. The one who is worshipped, meaning ma'bud. The one who is worshipped. This is the first meaning that comes from the word Allah. The second meaning that comes from this word or related is two things. One is to be confounded, to be bewildered, and, uh, or to almost lose your mind. You say, how can that be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Meaning that we cannot comprehend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All efforts to understand the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will leave your mind confounded and bewildered. You cannot fathom our brains, our limited minds cannot understand, cannot comprehend, cannot fathom the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will leave Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said that my inability, my incomprehension of you, Ya Allah, is the comprehension of you. Meaning, you tru truly know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you believe you can never truly know him. You truly comprehend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you accept that you can, truly, you can never truly know him or comprehend him or understand him. Because he's beyond our ability. We cannot, we've never seen him. It's beyond our limited mind to understand his reality. The third meaning is um, Sakina. Another meaning that comes from the word Allah is Sakina, tranquility. And this is a very clear uh, relationship. That isn't it with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the hearts are find peace or the hearts are stilled. And the fourth meaning is the one that everybody needs, the one that everybody turns to in the time of need. So you have all of these four meanings related to just to the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously he he is much more than that. We're just talking about the word Allah. Bismillah. Then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used this word, Allah instead of Rahman, he could have said Bismir, Bismir Rahman, or Bismir Razak, or Bismir Ghafur, or something, one of his other names. By him using this name Allah, it allows us to use this sentence, Bismillah, in any action that we do, which is good, and it becomes the most appropriate name. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you are hungry, when you're in need of rizq, you'll call ar razaq When you want to make tawbah, and you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your sins, you'll call on the ghafoor. When you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on you, you'll call on ar rahim And so forth. For every need, there is a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you had to do that every time you have a particular need, and you had to say in the name, of ar or in the, for, for, for rizq, for provision, or for mercy in the name of Ar-Rahim, or to, to forgive you in the name of Al-Ghafoor. This would be impossible for most people to do. First of all, we don't know many names apart from a few that we know. We don't know all the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, how are we going to remember which one to say at what point? But by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us this word in this sentence, it actually means that I begin in the name of Allah seeking help with his most relevant, appropriate name for the action I'm about to do. SubhanAllah. Isn't that a gift? Isn't that a blessing? I am beginning in the name of Allah which contains the most appropriate, most relevant name that will fulfill the need I am calling him for. That I am beginning this action for. So when we say Bismillah, it contains all his names and the one most appropriate to the thing you are doing. 
The other thing is, you'll notice in this sentence, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In actual fact, it's an incomplete sentence. Because if you translated it, it would mean in the name of Allah. Obviously, we don't mean incomplete as deficient. This is the Quran, these words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, they said uh, it's mahdu, you know, it's mahduf, it's, uh, it's omitted, if you like, because it's understood. So the sentence reads, in the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. But what's the meaning? In the name of Allah, what? It means in the name of Allah, most merciful, most compassionate. It could mean I read. It could mean I sleep. It could mean I eat. These meanings, the second part of the sentence is omitted. The second part of the sentence is omitted. Two reasons. One is, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is in the beginning of the Quran. These are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It does not, even in the form, forget the meaning and the content for a second, even in the form, the written form, it does not befit anyone else to be there. If it, if it said, if the sentence was Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, aqra, aqra ul kitab, then this fa'il and fa'il, you the doer, and the action would be there in the in the beginning of the Quran. That's one thing. The the position of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim does not is not befitting for any subject, doer, any other person to be there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left it, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The second thing is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left it open and general. He hasn't specified that, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, aqra'u. He hasn't specified that, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I read or I begin to open the Quran. He hasn't specified that. He's left it open. It means that whenever you use this, you don't have to mention what you're doing. So when you go to sleep, when you're eating food, when you're opening your shop in the morning, when you leave the house, when you enter the house, when you enter the masjid, whatever action you're doing, you can just simply say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and the second part, the second part is the blank is automatically filled, and therefore this sentence becomes applicable for an unlimited amount of situations in our lives. It becomes applicable for any good that we're doing. And the barakah and the isti'an, the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the uh, blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is in the action simply by mentioning this sentence. This is the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And this is very, very important because this is the introduction to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's opening his book. He's starting his book. And he's introducing his name. Although Allah contains all the names, but then he chose specifically Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And this is so important. First impressions count, as they say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to introduce himself to us with those qualities of his, of mercy, of compassion. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim are what they call mubalagha. When a word is in such a form that it has extra meaning or extra power. So Ar-Rahman is not just merciful. It is the one who is overflowing with abundance of mercy and compassion all of the time. It's just overflowing. It's there all the time. It covers the whole universe. It covers all his creation. It is there with, with, with in, in a quality that can only be appropriate for the divine. It is something we cannot imagine, we cannot fathom, we cannot limit with our own understanding of what this mercy is. And, and Rahim, same thing, it's on the Mubalagha. It's, it's powerful, it's extra, it's always there. But Rahim, they said, is connected to the believers. Rahman is for everybody. 
Rahman is for the believers, disbelievers, everybody, the whole creation. And it's always there. But Rahim is connected to the believers. This is a special kind of extra mercy just for the believers. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَانَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَحِيمًا That he was merciful to the believers. He didn't say Rahmana. He said Rahima with the believers. But when he's talking about his dominion and power and his controlling the affairs, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arshi istawa. That Ar-Rahman rose over the mighty throne. So Ar-Rahman is for everybody, whereas Rahim is connected to the believers. So this is a very important introduction to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is not related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. This informs us how we should be. The, the first hadith that many, many uh, scholars of hadith teach to their students is, is the following one found in uh, Abu Dawud and Tirmidhi. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ar-Rahimuna yarhamuhumu ar-Rahman Irhamu man fil ardi Yarhamukum aw yarhamkum man fil sama The hadith of Rahma Musalsal bil awaliya This is often the first hadith that teachers of hadith teach their students because it goes back up to a certain narrator who said this is the first hadith that I heard from my teacher and then it's been continuous for many many centuries but how they're introducing the learning the, the science of the deen with this hadith which means that the merciful are shown mercy by the all merciful and it's a play on the word rahim or rahma the first sentence is three words with this word. So all three words contain this word, Rahma. The merciful ones are shown mercy by the all merciful. Have mercy to those on earth and the Lord of the heavens, the Rahman in the Sama, he will have mercy on you. So what is the practical lesson for us as believers here before we wrap up for today? The practical lesson, the practical implication of this, Bismillah rahman rahim this, this beautiful gift, this amazing sentence, is that we, in all our actions, we must be conscious of why we're doing it. We can't say Bismillah and uh, do something haram, can we? We can't. It has to be, we have to be conscious of why we're doing something. And we should think, can I say Bismillah on this action? That will prevent us from doing many, many haram. The second thing is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this beautiful sentence which contains all his names. It's such a powerful reliance. One of the uh, Mufassirun, they said that all of the revelations, the meanings of the revelations are contained in the four books, you know, uh, the Torah, the Injil, the, the Zabur, and Quran, all of these four, all of the revelations are in there. And then they said all of the four books are in the Quran, contained in the Quran. Then they said all of the meanings of the Quran is contained in Surah Al-Fatiha. And they said all of the meanings of Surah Fatiha is in Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. And they said the meanings of these two is contained in the bar of Bismillah Rahman Rahim. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us such a powerful sentence that contains the true essence of all revelation. What is revelation but to remind us to rely and to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and to follow him in, his, in our actions on our daily lives in accordance to the sharia, to, in accordance to the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought us. So this is the practical implication of Bismillah rahman rahim So with this, inshallah, we'll stop here for today. Um, there's, I think, a few minutes for questions, if people have any questions. And inshallah, from next week, we'll begin with Surah Al-Fatiha, inshallah. So the brother's asking that you know, all of these meanings that we, we just heard or when you read a tafsir in Arabic, 
obviously it's not present in the English translation. So what, what do we do? You know, people come very disappointed later on because they've been reading the English translation. Then they discover, subhanAllah, all these powerful meanings and, and eloquence and beauty of the sentence and the words. It's not there in the English. Um, and that's very true. That's why when you translate the Quran, it's, it usually says uh, translation of the meanings of the Quran. It's not the Quran. A translation is not the Quran. A translation will always be limited. There's only so much you can say. In, I believe there's been some efforts now to translate the Quran with a lot of the tafsir points together in, in one place. Uh, some criticism of, of some aspects of it, but there are efforts being made to improve that. That's probably the only way if you're just stuck in the English language, which most of us are, you're going to be able to a access the, the meanings. But also, some of the tafsir of the Quran are being translated as well. So you can access those. Ibn Kathir, I believe, all of it's been translated. Uh, Qurtubi, I'm not sure. Tabari, probably first volume or something like that. And, and maybe a few others have been translated. So they can access and, and get some of the meanings through the English tafsir as well. That's been translated now in English fully. I, I'm not aware of any other Quran tafsir that's been 100% translated. Um, what I meant yeah, is a good point. Um, brothers raised that, you know, somebody listening in is when I said Bismillah rahman rahim the sentence is incomplete. I don't mean it in any deficient way. It's not, it's not incomplete in that sense. Um, it's a bit of a um, linguistic point because in, in, uh, in Arabic when you have the ba, they say there, there is a something connected to the ba, something muta'allaq with the ba. That muta'allaq, that connecting thing is missing from Bismillah rahman rahim what is that connecting thing? It's usually something you're doing or a, a verb or an action. So the scholar said the missing thing, and it's on purpose, it's not, it's not incomplete in that sense. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left it, omitted it on purpose. So that you can fill in the blank. It can be much wider. It's am in its usage. So you can say, in the name of Allah, I read. In the name of Allah, I open the door. In the name of Allah, I, I do X, Y, and Z. So that's what I meant. It's a good point. It's good to make sure I clarify that. The question the brother had, yes. Yeah, I'll repeat the questions. Yeah. I'm wary of time. Uh, so let's take this one, and then I'll try and answer what the brother mentioned. Okay, the brother's asking, what's the difference between translation and tafsir? Translation is usually from Arabic, to another language. So it's just the words and the sentences translated into English. So an example is Bismillah rahman rahim would be translated as in the name of Allah, the most compassionate or most merciful or most beneficent. So that's a translation. Tafsir is the explanation, either in Arabic or in another language, is the explanation of these words. What do they mean? What is uh, the significance of this word, of this sentence? What's the connection between this verse and the last? When was it revealed? Uh, is there any hadith related to it? That's the tafsir. Tafsir is the explanation. Translation is moving simply from one language to another. Is that, is that clear? Kind of. The brother had a question which was, he, he said the Quran wasn't present as a book in the time of the Prophet It wasn't uh, in the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and uh, Umar and uh, then until Uthman radiallahu anhum jami'an. Um, that's not correct. Um, first of all, the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he, he has revealed this book and indeed uh, we will preserve it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran in its entirety to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very briefly. He revealed the entire Quran through Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet sallallahu who memorized it entirely without any mistakes, without any uh, omissions, right? From the beginning to the end. Every letter, every word. Um, Jibreel alayhi salam revised the Quran with the Prophet sallallahu all the time in Ramadan as well. 
extra. The Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet did two things. They memorized the Quran as well during the lifetime of the Prophet and they wrote down the Quran, not just one person, more than one person. The Prophet had assigned scribes who wrote down the Quran, the entire Quran, during his lifetime, but not collated in a book, in one book. They wrote it down on different uh, parchments, on leather, on bone, on skin, different materials. But they wrote it all down in its, entire, in, in, in its entirety and they memorized the entire Quran. So we don't rely on uh, a particular book that came later. What the Uthman copy that you said, in, in, when you open up, this is Uthman copy or Uthmani copy of the Quran. That is something different because the Quran was collated even before Uthman radiallahu an. It was put into a book before Uthman radiallahu an. But as you know, the Prophet said that the Quran has been revealed on seven ahruf, seven letters. In other words, the Quran was revealed on in Arabic, number one, but it had space and room for different dialects of the Arab tribes around the Prophet, around the Quraysh. But it was revealed in, in the dialect of the Quraysh, but it allowed for, in certain instances, in certain words, a, a variation of uh, a letter or, or the way you pronounce something without changing the meaning. It allowed some variation. Now these variations and, and uh, these copies were being you know, copied one after another. These were existing. But also, the people who memorized the Quran were, were present, the Sahaba and their students and their students. Now what happens is, by the time of Uthman radiallahu an, the, the Muslims have now gone into many, many other lands, new non-Arab lands. New Muslims are coming into the deen. They're having to learn the Quran. Now, sometimes they may come across this dialect, or sometimes they come across this way of writing. And in, in the beginning, there was no tashkil. There were no fatha, damma, and kasra. So there was a possibility of new Muslims who were non-Arab, Arabic was not their tongue, of them being confused, or finding it difficult, or making mistakes, etc., etc. So what Uthman radiallahu anhu, he, he did, is he made one as the imam of the Mus'haf, the Quran, one copy. That was the standard, if you like. All the other copies, they didn't have different meanings or different words. Yes, there are some acceptable slight variations in, in the letters or the pronunciation, and it could slightly change the meaning, but not significantly. What Uthman radiallahu an did, and, and this is part of the preservation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised, he standardized one version. And, and very clear, and he asked the others to be burnt. But in, the, in terms of those who memorized the Qur'an, they memorized knowing different variant readings of the Qur'an. That was still present. But he asked the others to be burnt to avoid confusion. And that's why today, alhamdulillah, we have millions and millions of copies of Qur'an, and no two are dissimilar to each other. They're, no two are different. They're exactly the same. Millions of copies. Millions of copies throughout the centuries. You can pick up the exact Uthman, radiallahu, his copy in, in, from one of the museums where it's kept either in Turkey or somewhere else, and you can compare with today's copy and there's no difference. So it's, and, and he wasn't killed because he arranged the Quran. That's, that's a misinformation. He was killed for some other reason. There were was, there was some other political issues going on. It wasn't because he was gathering. And secondly, very important, the order of the Quran. We know it was revealed in one order with Iqra first, right? It was revealed in one order over 23 years. But in terms of compila compilation, it was done in a different order, which we find today in the Mus'haf starting from Surah Al-Fatiha 
to Surah An-Nas. But that ordering sequence was done in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. He told his scribes, place this ayah in this surah, place this surah after this surah, place this surah before this surah. So there's no interference of any other people in terms of the sequence, the formatting, the compilation, nothing. The Quran is exactly as it has been revealed to the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, exactly as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised to preserve it.